let's just be fucking honest here. Like, who here, let's just say, at least once a week, has a thought about killing themselves? Raise your hand. Suicide thoughts. Like, you're not going to do it, but it just kind of kicks in. Like, why don't I just fucking end it? <laughs> Crazy. Huh? No? Who here, on average, say, if you take a week, 80% of the time, you're just kind of down, hating what you're doing, and just trying to escape the day or escape that moment? Raise your hand. Crazy. Who here, their favorite, happiest moment of their life was during their childhood? Raise your hand. All right. Now, this is crazy, by the way, and it's something to really reflect on. Like, number one, if the happiest moment of your life was during your childhood, what the fuck has been going on since? That should be like an urgent wake-up call, like, holy shit, like, I'm reminiscing on my childhood. What have I been doing? Am I even living if that was my happiest moment? Okay. Number two, the whole, like, feeling down, trying to escape your day, and having those thoughts of suicide is so fucking common, it's insane. And it's something you're shamed for outside this room, which actually makes it worse. You know, this is my little rant on it. Like, in society nowadays, you're shamed for being depressed. You're shamed for being down. You're shamed for having those thoughts. You're told, like, hey, that's not normal. If you have those thoughts, that's not normal. Does that help? Yes or no? Like, say you're depressed. You're like, fuck, I hate myself. Hey, there's something wrong with you. That's not normal. You'll hate yourself even more. It just compounds the fucking effect. No? So if... You're in this situation, step one, just being aware here, like, hey, I'm not alone. Huh, it's not just me. Like, were a lot of you kind of shocked so many hands came up? Yeah, it's insane. Like, if you go deeper behind, like, the little fronts, like, everything's okay. Like, how are you doing? I'm great, great, great. Bullshit, how are you really doing? No one's going to shame you. How are you really doing? Hey, I'm kind of down. Hey, you know what? I kind of hate my life right now. Hey, you know what? Existing is kind of tough right now. Guess what? That's 99.9% .9 of people. And I use that number a lot, 99.9% .9 of people. <laughs> Maybe it's not that, but it's a high percentage of people. And it's something that really shocked me the past few years, like diving deeper into this coaching, you know, like going, say, beyond success with women, like diving deep into, say, past traumas or different Skype coachings I'm doing. I'm like, holy shit, like this inner world, like all this baggage we carry is insane and no one addresses it. It's like our deepest secret. Like, so many people go through f fucked up shit. You know, I talk about my scandal a lot, but that is nothing compared to the stuff I hear. Absolutely nothing. Yet we hide it, and we never address it, and we run away from it, and we just live in hell. Like, do any of you actually feel like you're just living in hell? It's like, hey, you're 2018, things are great, but you're in this personal hell. You know, we talked about it before, like, you wake up, you're triggered, you read your text, you're pissed off, like every little thing gets to you. There are people who can't even leave their door because they know they're gonna get triggered. Even just social anxiety triggered. Like, do you need to suffer by social anxiety? You just can't walk out the door? That's insane. Yet, what do you do about it? Nothing, you hide it, you pretend everything's okay, and you just keep pretending it's not there. And every day that passes, you pretend everything's fine, guess what? There's more and more dread around facing that shit. And that was the thing I realized, like, the, the best example I can give you is say, classic one, you go out tonight and you spend too much. So you buy, you know, you buy a couple drinks and you're like, shit, I spent a little too much. Say a girl talks to you like, hey, let's have a drink. You're like, yeah. She leaves. Next day you wake up, you're like, fuck. Do you want to check your account to see exactly how much you spent? No, because you're going to feel horrible. You're like, oh my God, I don't want, I, it, I'd rather not know. I can't be broke if I don't know. <laughs> right? And then you keep living every day like that. Like, and every day that passes, there's more and more dread around checking your bank account. That's just with something external like your bank account one night out. We do that with different parts of ourselves. That's what you do with your internal baggage. It's like there's this fucking monster in the closet and every single day from your childhood, you're just trying to stuff that and run away from it and avoid it and it creates a living hell. Okay? And the approach I'd suggest to you here, and this is the promote, uh, approach I'm really promoting, is instead of running away from it, instead of distracting yourself, instead of trying to escape it, instead of trying to compensate for it, why not face it directly? Why not face that inner hell? And step one, just looking around here, is realizing you're not alone, and it's not, huh, if it's not just me, because that's one thing pain will do, it's like it's just you by yourself. 
if it's all of us, it kind of gives you that extra courage to dive into it. Because this is where like that really deep, intense work begins. You know, we think it's going out and like putting ourselves in intense situations and that's scary as fuck. I remember my first time going up and even saying hi to a stranger, so scary. But diving into your inner demons, it's going into hell. And you gotta be ready for that, but when you do, and someone asked me that before, like, what's one thing you tell me? It's like, keep going. The only way out is through. You've tried everything to avoid it. You've tried everything to run away from it. At what point are you gonna confront it? You probably spend your entire life trying to fix that inner hell. Doing everything. Getting more money, perhaps. More inter you know, external results. More success, more validation, more love, more relationships, better partner, whatever it is. Yet, did it change that inner hell? Most likely not. It might have temporarily distracted you. It might have temporarily numbed it a bit, but that's it. If you just sit by yourself sober for a day or two, you're right back in it. If you do nothing, like this is the ultimate test, do nothing for a week. I mean, eat, obviously, and sleep. But if you do nothing, you take no substances, you don't watch TV, you don't distract yourself. You don't go out and do like all these little events. You just sit with yourself, hang out with yourself. You're right back in hell. No? Crazy. That's the thing I realized, by the way, and you might have heard me talk about this before, right before the scandal. I was like, here, I have everything. Yet if I sit alone a little too long, I'm back in hell. At what point are you like, hey, maybe this approach won't work? The reason that Julian's bringing this up is because so we have a lot of contacts in the old school transformational community. And a, a buddy of mine whose family was involved in the, like th there's a lot of original transformational work that started getting popular in California, um, even as far back as, as like the 50s. It's, it's like really freaky stuff, it's, it's, it's crazy backstory. Maybe we'll do a talk on it someday, like a video blog on it someday, it's super fascinating. And that's evolved into areas of personal transformation of everything from, you might have seen courses like say Landmark or MITT or Psy. Um, these are called large group awareness trainings. And uh, some, of, some of our friends that, that come from these old school families that have helped us to create our curriculums over the years would come into, say, a class like the hot seat where we show hidden camera video and we're breaking down how to meet women and socially interact step by step by step. Now, these courses are unreal. I mean, we've spent years and years and years coming up with every little social nuance and shedding light on it, showing you how to use it in your favor, showing you how to get better results in everything from dating to social networking to your job to just making friends. And all of it's amazing. Like, we love this stuff. We're incredibly passionate about it. But one of our buddies would keep coming in and he'd say, you know, it's incredible all these different things that everybody's learning. He says, do you know what I see? I said, what? This, this is a buddy of mine who's, who's brilliant, very successful. And he's, again, he comes from one of those old school families. He says to me, Owen, these people need help. They're in pain. And they think that if they, you know, maybe get better at dating, that the pain's gonna go away. And being successful in dating and social skills is something that's important no matter what. I, I think sometimes people kind of try to discount that. They're like, what does all that matter unless you're happy? Like having great results in the outer world is important for your happiness too. I, 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 neither Julian nor I nor Evie have ever advocated just focus on being happy and, and don't make your life better in the outside world. That's why we talk about success principles, social dynamic principles, all that stuff. That's why Julian's still very proud of all his dating videos. At the same time though, I think he made a very powerful point, which is he's looking in the room and my buddy who's from that old school transformation family, <laughs> which is sounding kind of weirder and weirder by the, every time I say it, um, I'll maybe give a little more detail later, but I just want to keep on the thread here. Um, he's saying, I'm seeing them in trauma and they think that when they learn dating, that's going to fix their trauma. They need help on this. Well, you know, this was many years ago. Julie and I had a decent amount of knowledge on transformation, but we realized that we had to take it further. And so I try to try to really put this in context that when we learned about dating, we would we would look at men and women interacting and we'd watch the dynamic between the two of them or in the group. We called it real social dynamics. And real social dynamics is you're, you're looking at social dynamics between people. And then we have to have an eye a very nuanced, aware eye to be able to break that down. And then he would break it down, Evie break it down, all our whole crew at RSC is breaking it down. And then what we do behind the scenes is we're always having conversations. We're having conversations about dating, social status, state, technique, all this different stuff behind the scenes and really drilling down, right? So if any of you guys have the experience where you look at say some of our dating stuff and you're like, how do they know that? How do they figure all that out? 
How do they get the eye to look beneath the surface and figure out what's happening? And the basic way that we got is something that you can cultivate too. It's a decision to look. It's a choice to look. Instead of just derping around going, I want this, I want that. You guys have ever heard us talking about coping versus thriving? Well, the whole reason we don't like people in coping is that they never open their eyes to what's around them to be able to thrive. So even something as simple as say marketing, you've gotta be in the head of the person who you're marketing to. Something as simple as dating, I mean, these aren't simple things, but something like these topics, simple topics on the surface, you have to have your eyes open to be able to look at the other person. Something that we have our eyes open to in our private conversations that you wouldn't be privy to, and this is what winds up coming out in content, is we're looking at people and we're seeing the trauma right in their pupil. And you can't trick us. Everywhere that we go, we're seeing people that are dealing with trauma. This could be in the mainstream and mainstream news sources to things that are behind the scenes. For example, any, any LA Laker fans here today? Okay, so great stuff. LeBron's coming, it's incredible. So now we look at say Kawhi Leonard, right? Well, Kawhi Leonard, this incredible basketball player. Look, we don't know him personally, but let's just, let's speculate. That's the kind of conversation we have. We would kind of just guess, even if we're wrong, we would just kind of explore it. So if we were to just guess or speculate, we look at Kawhi, Kawhi Leonard, some people say he's the second best player in the NBA. Probably has some different opinions on, that's a big debate, right? But second best player. Well, Kawhi Leonard only has 500,000 a year in endorsements, even though some people would call him in the conversation for second best player behind LeBron. Why does Kawhi only have 500K a year in endorsements, supposedly? Any guesses? He doesn't talk. Yell that out louder, please. He doesn't talk. He doesn't talk. Now, whenever you look, when you look at Kawhi Leonard, are you like, this guy's very jubilant, or is it a guy who looks kind of sad all the time? <laughs> very reserved, right? And he even had a conflict recently with Greg Popovich and, and his team, the Spurs, this incredible team, this crazy conflict. He can't talk. Everybody keeps saying this. He can't emote. He can't talk. Well, when we dig underneath the surface, what do we find out? His dad was murdered. And he's carrying the fucking trauma energy of his father being murdered. Okay, one of the single most horrible, horrifying things. I mean, essentially, the, these basic acts of, you know, kidnap, assault, murder, all these things. And his dad's been murdered. Now, you know, it's not clear to me his entire background. He, he comes, my understanding is the inner city. I'm not clear on that, but that's my understanding. And I'm sure there's a lot of traumatizing thing happening there too. Some people take it better than others. Well, look at, look at him, man. And now this guy, second best basketball player in the world, he's having confusion in his organization, communication issues. He doesn't get the endorsements that he wants. There's a lot of confusion going on there, right? And when you look at Kawhi Leonard, who's this incredibly talented player, this, this miracle of a player, well, we see that everywhere we look. And you see that in the suicide of, of whether it's Anthony Bourdain and other high profile suicides. My cousin committed suicide a couple years ago. Well, I've known other people that, that commit suicide. I've, I've known people that came through our programs. You know, out of the thousands upon thousands or even millions of people who we reach, we've seen in amongst those guys that took their own lives. And this is like some pretty heavy stuff, right? Now, obviously something like suicide, that's very, very heavy stuff. But you know, I don't think anyone in this room will do that, but what I would say is that there's people that are gonna carry that energy and it gets to the point where you're just trying to make it through the day. And I can remember this when I'm younger, if we're gonna kind of drill down and give some examples of what, what he was just talking about. I remember waking up when I was younger and I, I remember I would just try to fill my day up. Like what he was saying, whenever I was left alone with my thoughts, it was, my mind was very noisy. I didn't wanna be left alone with my thoughts. So maybe I go to the video arcade. I got very, very good at Street Fighter 3 Alpha Edition. Pretty cool. X-Men versus Street Fighter, X-Men versus Capcom, XCOM versus Marvel. I could kick ass. I beat the crap out of everybody except this one like eight-year-old Japanese kid that came and destroyed everybody. I was like insane. So it's quite an eye-opening day. So, you know, he's probably making a lot of money right now in the video game circuit or something. So, you know, I would do that. Then I would go eat fast food. I lived in Ottawa. I'd go to the Rito Center. I'd get New York fries, pizza, pizza, all this like really kind of low vibration food and it would kind of just kind of medicate what was going on. Then I would try, I, I had a little business and I was always trying to, you know, work on the business all the time. I, I would just workaholic, 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 so I don't have to be left alone with my thoughts. Then at one point I realized that I could be an academic and I, this was kind of a really cool thing. You know, if you're not gonna learn what he's teaching, you could try this. <laughs> I uh, started going to, at a young age, the university library. I started actually sneaking into the Ottawa U library um, and just reading books. And that's actually how I became an academic was, I mean, academic, right? But that's kind of how I became academically minded and later became an academic was I would, just to try to get through the day, I would go 
I, I would literally take a bus downtown, sneak into the college library, and I would just sort, start sorting through um, uh, books about you know the Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer or about the World Banking Federation and IMF and all this stuff. And I would do independent study projects on it in, in high school. My projects were so good that I could get into any college that I wanted. They would take my projects and pass them around to everybody, say, read Owen's thing. And I'd been a shitty student up till that point until I found that library thing. And on one side, that was really cool. It kind of gave me a lane forward. But on the other side, well, where was that coming from? I didn't want to be left alone with my thoughts for very long. And a really big one for me was I, I was completely convinced that if I could get a girlfriend, the pain would go away. I totally attributed it to the fact that I didn't have a girlfriend and I would just sit there like just imagining walking down the beach with a girl, right? It's actually pretty awesome having a girlfriend. It's actually pretty awesome having money. It's actually, all this stuff is awesome and you should learn social skills and how to date. You don't wanna just heal trauma and do nothing. The point is to, is to become happy and use that as, as, as a platform. Use that as a platform to do stuff in a happy way. But what he's trying to say is that all of us, we go through our day and what you have to ask yourself is, when I'm not, when I'm not having either distraction, medicating it either with, and what do you think is the, like the Prozac antidepressant rate in this country? Through the roof. It's called an SSRI, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. SSRIs, out of control in this country, a lot to do with the diet and lifestyle and sleep issues as well. Um, study all that. Um, Ultramind Solution by Mark Hyman is a great starting place. But, you know, we're, we're literally in this, in this weird state. And so we're just sitting there looking at it and we're saying, there's not a lot of people who teach dating and we gotta, we gotta make sure there's great information on dating out there. We're so passionate. And that's why we'll be running out there with hidden cameras and teaching dating forever. But we also had to be responsible at a certain point. You know, you got a client, you're teaching him, you're trying to teach him how to be an alpha male. You're looking at the guy and you're going, this guy is completely tore up. And then we're trying to get him to use your voice. Don't break the eye contact. Come up with something funny. Well, that, you, you know, you go to Kawhi Leonard, you're like, make a joke, Kawhi. And he's like, because his dad was murdered. <laughs> it's just getting a bit, you know, uh. it's what, what are the chances of that working? And so for, for us at, at, and our team, we're, we want to be like a one-stop shop. We're always digging. We're always researching. And we've got a great eye for what goes on beneath the surface from years of teaching dating. Julian's eye is ridiculous. This guy's eye this guy understood women in the dating scene on a level that I had never, I'm like, this guy is, it, it's either he's psychic or he's a, a hot girl trapped in a man's body was my other theory because he understands them so well. I'm like, I don't know how he could know. He would know the exact thing to say. He would be miles deep in, in girls' heads. Well, well Julian took, deep. he's miles deep in something. Yeah. So basically what wound up happening was Julian wound up taking that same eye. I wound up taking that same eye. Evie's been around this culture. Evie's had some crazy things he's been through and wind up looking at people. And once you start looking at the lens that of people are basically traumatized and they're trying to get through their day either by medicating it, running away from it, um, distracting themselves from it, just, you know, stuffing it. Who here stuffs it as a guy? That was my big one. I couldn't cry until I was 26. I learned how to cry at 26. I was like, wait, I'm, I'm able to cry. And then that year that I taught myself how to cry, I cried almost every day for fun. I'd be in my little library. I, I was now in college and I was like, I'm gonna try to make myself cry again. I was like, whoa, I, can, I was like, this is so cool because I thought I was tough. In the, in the culture that I came from, and again, this kind of like lower vibration, you know, kind of backwoods mentality. If you cry, what does that mean about you? It means you're a little bitch. And me and my friends would talk, me and my friends would say, I haven't cried in 10 years. Yeah. And then it, like some guy would be like, well, I cried like, like we would have debates on if your dad died, is it okay to cry or are you a bitch? I mean, I grew up in a, okay, like to be really blunt here, I grew up in a culture where even going down on a woman made you a bitch. You know that, do you guys know this? What? No, no, this is actually true. Like going down on, like I'm 38, going down on girls only became like, in certain circles, okay, other guys might disagree, but in circles I was in, that became something that you could talk about openly maybe only like 10 years ago or so. And now it's like embarrassing if you, you know, don't do it, right? But back then it was like, you licked a girl's pussy, that's like licking her pee, it's disgusting, you know? Maybe that, maybe that, maybe we had it right, I don't know, but the point is, that, that was part of the culture because it was like very manly, like, when I grew up you couldn't even sit like this or you're a bitch. That was the kind of environment that I, that I grew up in, right? On yeah, note. yeah, it was true. Also, you had to get it, okay, where That's I grew like up, yeah, you had to get in fights. Everybody was used to getting in fights. You had to go get in a fight. Even if you weren't a good fighter, you had to go 
put that fight in to establish that you're a man. That was the kind of culture I came from. I came from a culture, you know, we play hockey outdoors, you get a puck in the, in the mouth, blows your teeth out, you think that's awesome. It's a badge of honor. Um, you know, if you're in kind of some violent stuff, maybe some guy puts a knife up to your throat, you're like, slit my fucking throat, you piece of shit. You fucking kill me, you fucking kill me. Maybe some guy, some little idiot has a gun, shoot me. Shoot me now, you little bitch. Shoot me fucking dead. And again, I've, I've mentioned I came from some pretty weird stuff. I've mentioned that, okay? So I've seen some weird stuff, a couple weird, see, to you guys like, you're kind of laughing at this. Like, it's actually weird to me that not all you guys saw this. I'm like, isn't that like how all of us grew up? You know, probably, who of you guys came from a background like what I talked about? Couple, there you go. All right, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, I don't feel isolated here. So, you know, but look, it, it doesn't have to be like that. Like, that's that kind of small town, like weird mentality where people get in a fight because they're not going anywhere. They're never traveling to Europe, so they might as well get in a fight in hopes that a girl will like them, which, of course, the girl doesn't like them for that. It looks self-qualifying. But maybe there's, like, some girl that thinks that's cool. So that's, like, a kind of, an, or, or, like, I don't know. I mean, Sarah, what, where did, okay, let me ask you a question. It, where you grew up in, what's, what's the population in Australia where you grew up? Uh, loud, loud. Three million. Three million, okay. So is that the actual city you're from is three million, or is that the nearest neighboring city? Okay, you're from Adelaide, right? Did you ever have, do any of the guys from where you're from just get so, like, compete to see who could get the most drunk and act like the biggest idiot? 100%, and they're always like, oh, fuck, and like, oh, fuck, and like. Here, come up and explain that for a second if you want to. Okay, I just want to show the, the, the mentality, you know, that a lot of us kind of come from. Um, there is that too, by the way, in uh, Brisbane, Australia. There's a place called The Valley. And every five minutes, I could time it. There was a huge fucking fight, like over nothing. I could literally time it. It's like five yeah. minutes. Where is it? Boom, yeah. right there. Just sort of share with the, yeah. the group here, like, because uh, I kind of grew up around this. Like, what do guys do in Australia to prove how cool they are? Um, Not everybody, of course. Well, they just like drink as much as they can or do beer bongs. Like that was a huge culture. Like whoever could do as many of them. And then it would just be a matter of time, like before, all right, who's gonna fight? Like it would literally just a primal thing. Like, all right, like who's gonna fight? Yeah, like. And didn't you? you know, and didn't you totally want to go home with the guy that won the fight? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone breaks right out now. fighting right now. <laughs> <laughs> Not uh, at all. Like uh, it was like awkward. Like for the girls, it was like, oh, like you know, like stop, and then girls would jump in front, like to try and stop it, and you you just feel really uncomfortable. Like it wasn't an attractive thing. It was like kind of just lame. Really kind of lame, lame, right? And because, does that look manly to you or does it look self-qualifying? Self-qualifying, like they're trying to make up for something. It's like, why do you have to prove something? And usually they're always just talking. It's like, yeah, no, like I had this massive fight. Like the stories with guys, it's always like, yeah, like, you know, yeah, like you never see it, but they talk about it. They're like, no, I beat that guy up and I like, you know, bash that guy. It's like, cool, but I've never seen it. And that's happened with multiple guys. <laughs> like, multiple, and I'm like, okay, I know that you are all just talking shit because I've never seen you actually fight someone. I still do totally have the fantasy that, like, I, I beat some guy up and then a girl fucks me for it. I think that'd be so awesome. <laughs> don't we all feel that way? But it just doesn't pan out. Look, I don't know, maybe mm. if that actually happened and, like, they brought out some really cool moves and I was like, uh. whoa, like, uh, Rob McGar or something, mm. and it was like, you know, like, you actually. See the good mm. moves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He like winks at you while he's doing yeah. it. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah then Trading Instagrams while he pounds. Oh, wow, like, you know, mm. martial arts. Yeah, could you guys give her a hand for sharing this lovely story? <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. And it's funny, it's funny because I grew up a lot around that kind of culture. And a lot of my friends, that's what we do for fun. <laughs> we go, we come up to some people, to like specifically some shy dude, and we start ditching him until he like, he like it's enough if he does this. That's it. He's going down, and that's what they do for fun. And then I did kickboxing for three years. Then we would meet at the practice, and we would talk about like how did the weekend go. They're like, oh well, uh, went out, and uh, there was this guy in the, on the train. He was getting mad about something, and then like I knocked him out, and then. I went about my day. That, that was like the thing to do for fun. Like that, it's crazy how those environments can actually make people do violent stuff. You and your buddies would go do that, but like, and you say it's fun, right? I, I didn't participate, but that's what some other people did. Okay, got it. Okay, so like where I grew up, like the same kind of bullshit. And 
people act like they think it's fun, but it's not fun. Even a lot of the heavy drinking that my buddies and, and even like I drank for like a little bit when I was in high school, we go off in the forest, just get all fucking wasted. They're not even enjoying it. The liquor itself tastes like gasoline. You're just trying to show that you're tough. Then later you somehow get into the lifestyle of it, even though you might have not even liked it in the first place. It's very bizarre how the whole thing works. And a lot of these, um, like it's kind of funny too, because we think of these small towns as being very cute and kind of like, like this cute, um, golden era of small towns. But a lot of time when you go to them, they have things like crystal meth problems. You know why one of the biggest problems? There's signs everywhere that says, it says cook rice, not ice. <laughs> it's, you know what I mean? You know, you're from Hawaii, huh? I'm from Colorado. Did you guys do ice? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's great. He's a meth head, so that's why you're in the right place. <laughs> so, but you know, did any of your friends do meth? Yeah. I, I, do you want to come share about your friends doing meth? Just come to the front. There was this one guy in my high school who like he was he had like scholarships to like top colleges for swimming and everything and then I think he he broke his foot and then he had to like retake PE or something ironic cuz he should have credit cuz he was in sports and shit but yeah so all that happened and then all of a sudden he's just like riding around on a moped threatening people with a gun and like doing meth all the time yeah and I have other friends that like they didn't even have anything that fucked up going on for them, but because they were like in that environment, Kona's like a really small town and there's like not much Well, you're from on. Kona. Yeah. Well, me and you stopped there once on an airplane ride. We had a crazy story from there. Oh yeah. Remember? Yeah. Oh yeah. An old lady tried to have a Do tag team with me us. and Julian. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, we know her. I might know that mm. lady. <laughs> yeah. Well, we actually stopped in Hilo. She's from Hilo. Okay, so you know how it is. I've been there like five like times. Here, share it here. Come up, come up. You got to do it. This is great. It's good stuff. Let's hear about meth and teenage pregnancy. Go. I said, um, growing up, I had like 30 girls in my grade get pregnant, and the first one was sixth grade. And that same girl had three kids before we graduated. Well, I don't think she graduated, but. Hopefully, um, never see these videos. <laughs> We're just outing their stories. I well, now I'm just feeling like I'm behind. <laughs> Getting out competed. Huh. But yeah, what, what I, was saying, condoms, man. I was saying, like, there was nothing going on for these people. Like, they just have, like, the same life every day. They work at the fucking, like, paint shop or whatever. Um, hey, Spencer, what's up? Sorry. <laughs> but, um, yeah, people would, get into, people would get into bad shit. Would they ever huff the paint? I'm, I'm kinda, would like, they huff the paint? I'm kind of trying to backpedal that Did they huff the paint, though? <laughs> Come on. Not, not, yeah. Okay. Some people. Some people. What, is, what does meth do to people? Um... Well, I, I have friends that have done it and then come out of it, but it's just like, you know, you, you just, you find yourself doing it and then you're ripping off your friends and then like, you, you know, they, they, you let them, they let you borrow money and then you're just like, you know, and it's, sometimes it's not as bad as it seems. Sometimes it's really fucking bad, but it's, I don't know, it's small town syndrome. That's what I see. Got it. Got it. Right. So the, the stereotype of the cute small town you got, you know, 30 teenage pregnancies, people huffing down crystal meth chemicals. How much fighting was there where you came from? Oh, oh lots. Well, like in high school, it was like every day, it was so every fun. day. And it was, it was awesome. Everybody now here's another thing it, that they don't know because like, I lived in Hawaii it. for four years. They don't know about this. The big thing, and I love Hawaii by the way. Big thing in Hawaii is MMA. And these guys don't just fight each other. I mean, they beat the living shit out of each other. And the coolest truck to have in Hawaii is a monster truck. That's the shit is you, you drive a monster truck, you, you take MMA, beat the shit out of people, crack down some ice, just kidding. But you see the main idea, right? Yeah, no, big trucks, everybody, whole bra gets scrapped and then you go in the fucking the, yard and then. There's like a park behind my high school mm. called Lokahi Park, yeah. where every day after school they'd go and fight and it would be like family fights too, where there's families in the town, <laughs> their parents are mad at each other or like a sister says something about another sister so the brothers would fight or. Oh, yeah. It was like a whole thing, and then whenever there were fights on campus, everyone would run. It'd be like the most fun thing. We'd call, oh, scrap, everyone go. And then you go to the main quad uh, on campus, and then just uh, security would come, but they can't stop these big Samoan mm -hmm. kids, yeah, you know? Yeah, the security guards at my high school are like, are like 300 pound Samoans, just like, and it's you know, they just like Hawaii. grab the guys and like big pick Samoans, them off each other. Samoans. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and you know, I, um, there's, there's never been a place where I've had so many guys like come and attack me when I'm doing um, 
um, you know, out in clubs and stuff. It's white, and the, especially as a white dude. Oh yeah. They don't like no, white it, people. it got really, here. Tell them that because it sounds yeah. like I'm being crazy. Yeah, so no, you tell it, them. It got a lot better in the last 15 years, but I like I have friends that went to high school like a few years before me, and they'd have like Kill Howley Day. Where like if you're white like Howie right Howie Howie yeah, like H A O L E, like you know if you're white back then now everyone's fucking white in Hawaii so it doesn't really matter but back then like just like 15 years ago you'd get really like they bully the shit out of so you. So I'm very I'm very like I love to explore so I will go to like Wine Eye. We have videos shot in Wine Eye where we go to like oh. the Crystal Meth <laughs> Con. We shoot videos there. Like you can overlay this in the video. You have a video. I took you there. He <laughs> probably didn't fully realize. I know there was I, the fucking dog I, that ran by. A uh -huh. stray I, dog. I love going to Wine Eye, and I've been in the backwoods of Hilo. I've been out into the into the lava pools. One time I was there naked in the place that they're from, <laughs> completely naked, and about 20 monster trucks pull up. And I'm naked ass Howley, and I've got no clothes on. I'm gonna try to get in a fight with my cock out, and I realize I'm about to be maybe beaten to death. And then I just started acting like I'm on on meth. I was like, ah, like that, and they're just like, fuck this guy. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's pretty epic. And um, but I, I will go explore and all kind of, and that's why it's cool to learn real social dynamics. You can kind of learn to deal with it. I come from that kind of same background, so I know how to deal with that. But, you know, there's like a street smarts you get from that. But um, also to add to it is like, there. They think of this like, like Hawaii is so unique. Look, I rep Hawaii. I lived there for four years. I view myself as part of Hawaii. I fucking rep Hawaii to the day I die, man. I love Hawaii. I love that place. I'm, I'm heading there tomorrow. But the point being is like, there's these parts of Hawaii, like we think of it as this completely peaceful place. And yet knowing the insides of it, what it, how does that, where's the discrepancy there that my people may not understand about the real Hawaii? It, it's just like for the people that live there, it's just, the thing is, I always say this, cause like living in a small town is hard enough, right? But then you're living in a small town that's also on an island. So if you're on a small town out here on the mainland, you can like, you can drive to the fucking city and you can see what it's like in the city. But being on big island, I know so many people that have just never left the island. And they just like, they have no concept of like anything else that's out there in the real world. Now, and by the way, Hawaii, and you might want to explain this a bit, has a collective pain body. Now, I'm not completely clear on the history of this, but essentially, you know, you've got this incredible island. At some point, either Japan or America or somebody's taking it over. It has a military advantage for being there. That's why there's these military outposts all over Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, right? And a lot of the locals have, have a great pain body that their ancestors, um, sacred burial grounds have been taken over. We have a video that we shot in uh, Big Island that we're putting out this month, actually, and we meant to go to the top of this beautiful telescope at the top of Big Island, mm -hmm. and we couldn't get to the top because um, the uh, there was a protest there, yeah. right? So we shot near the top. It's a beautiful video, but if we'd got to the top, have they got rid of that protest? Yes, because I want to go back there and finish the damn video. Yeah, um, well, I, they're not, dude, people get over but, shit so fast. Okay, you know? well, that's good, so <laughs> I'll be back there. But, but, but just to sort of complete that thought, um, there's a collective pain body. Could you just could you give a very brief no, history of the yeah. pain body I, and I where know this exactly comes from? what you're talking about. It's like so everyone ident especially people that are full-blooded Hawaiian, they identify really strongly with the culture, and that's great. I think like I don't. I'm gonna try to keep this a little PC, but like you know, it's, it's like that. Sensitive so subject. you know, there's all that stuff with the annexation and stuff, and of course, if you look at the the, the details, it's not justified but everyone identifies with it so strongly and they don't they don't want to you know think about themselves you flew like here we grew today. here yeah they and there's you know they're so there's people that are like they're so white like they're 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 just like everybody else but they want to choose to because they're in pain themselves identify with all this like hurt that's going on with their ancestors you know it's very surreal to be in literal paradise you are literally looking at paradise but even in paradise these elements, and there's also all these other amazing elements and culture and everything. So we're kind of looking at one part of it here, okay? There's a lot of beautiful stuff going on there, clearly, okay? We're not discounting that, but just looking at it from this angle, it's amazing to be in paradise and see, even in paradise, that this can go on. And it shows you that even if you built the best life for yourself, if you don't get your low vibration energy or trauma energy handled, you can be living in paradise on Earth. But all that can loop in your mind is, the collective trauma or pain body, and it's, it's, it, it, it's, you have to see this to believe it. Could you guys give me a hand for this? Yeah, it's really crazy though, right? So, yeah, how to see it, guys, but thank you. So, the main idea being, and what Julian's kind of, kind of getting at here, is that you have situations where people are, are traumatized, and most people don't see that trauma energy, but in the same way that Julian has an eye for the dating stuff for guys, in the same way he has that eye 
to see trauma, energy, and people. And when he teaches, it's the craziest thing. Like, you get in a room this size, for example, and if he starts teaching the work that he's teaching, and you see people's stories that come up, your mind will be blown. Like, you look at this room here, and you think, oh, it's just everybody here is a regular person. I'm the only one struggling. And what you'll quickly find out is many people in that room could have been molested, could have had siblings or friends murdered. Have I mean, you want to kind of... Yeah. Yeah, no, it's crazy. It's... Uh... In mainstream, it's very common to hear, you know, like a lot of women were molested or abused, but it's men too. Now, I'm not going to have you like raise your hand or put you on the spot, but I can guarantee a few of you here, if not more than that, have been abused or molested. You know, I'm working actually with a few clients now, like molested by his mother, another one raped by his cousin, another one his brother was shot down by the police, another one his brother died in front of him. It's like, all this shit going on, completely regular cool people at the surface. And that's what we're getting at. It's like, you gotta look behind the scenes. Behind the scenes of what's going on out there, but also what's going on in yourself. You know, we live in such a state of denial. Like, everything's okay, everything's okay, everything's okay. Fuck no. What have you not addressed? What is fucking running you? You know, one way is to be aware of when you're triggered. Here's a common one with guys going up and saying hi to girls. You think you have approach anxiety. That's something I had where it's like, there's a girl, it's like, hey, go say hi. And I'd be like, <gasps> like freaking the fuck out. Literally as if I was about to jump off a cliff. Now, is that normal to be that afraid? To say hi to a girl? No, what's the worst that'll happen? No, thank you. So why does it feel like, like I'm jumping out of a fucking airplane with no parachute? Past trauma. That's you being triggered. Whenever your response to reality is disproportionate. You're in school, you're a kid, and say you like a girl and everyone finds out about it. How do they react? They're like, oh, you like a girl? <laughs> and they, everyone mocks you, shames you. The word gets out. Like, I'm from a small town, so it got around the town. My parents found out. I'm having dinner. It's like, so, you like this girl? And I'm like, no, no. Like, I try to deny it as if it was like, hell. That is trauma. Now, it's crazy. You're like, well, that's not traumatizing. You didn't go to war. They just found out that, you know, you liked a girl. But trauma isn't necessarily the thing, it's your experience of that thing. You getting lost in a grocery store, being like, oh shit, where is everyone? That's traumatic, that is trauma. And guess what, now it runs you. Here I am in my adult life, like, go say hi to a girl. And that same situation back then where it's like, never show this, never ever re-experience this fucking shit. Like it's too intense, hide that you like girls. Now it's a situation where people could find out or the girl could find out, <gasps> and there's that same survival instinct that kicks in. That's why even back in the day when it came to success with women, a lot of guys would get drawn to ways of attracting women that were like discreet, undercover, indirect. Why? Because now it's like, oh, I can get the girl without people finding out that I like the girl, without her finding out that I like her. <laughs> Trying to avoid that past trauma. That's one. What's another one? A breakup. That's a subtle one. But a lot of people get traumatized, say during their childhood or perhaps um, due to the way they were conditioned with their parents, and they get triggered by a breakup. Now, is a breakup fun? Best thing in order? No, it's, it's no, no. It's horrible. You know, it's like you go through a, a, a loss. You know, it's like it, you grieve. However, it's not something that should run you for the next 10 to 20 years. Do any of you guys have families that were very dysfunctional? You get into a relationship, you feel like you've found a new family, and then if it breaks up, it just triggers you on this horrible level? Put your hands up if you experience that. Mm. Yeah, that's something to be aware of. It's like, huh, okay, it's not fun to go through a breakup, but it should not still run me. That's a disproportionate response to reality. So that runs you. That's when you're triggered. So you can kind of use those to identify past trauma. As he said, too, look at different patterns in your life. You know, say your parents would fight a lot. You might be drawn to different relationships where there's a lot of drama. If your parents were divorced, you might be drawn to different partners where they're distant, long distance relationships where they cheat on you, where they're not fully available, and you just keep repeating the pattern, okay? And you're gonna keep repeating it, keep being triggered until you address it. How much are you run by this? Different patterns, self-sabotage, what you're drawn to. You were talking about as well, like growing up and trying to escape the day, like that used to be my day. Like waking up, and I remember waking up and I'd be pissed I was awake. I, I'd be like, fuck, why am I not still sleeping? I'd rather be sleeping than being awake. And then immediately it's like, Okay, I got a day to go. How am I going to distract myself for today? 
you know, whatever you could do to watch some shows, go on your phone, then you go to work, even at work or say during your studies, you're just trying to get in your, this, this spaced out headspace where the day flies by, you're looking at the watch all the time, like looking at the time, trying to get ahead, what the fuck is that? That's not living. If that's your life, that's just you trying to escape. It's like, what are you doing? And then as soon as I'd be home, I'm like, fuck, I'm home. Quickly, play some music, because I could not be in silence. Music, TV, internet, da da da, porn, torrents, movies, until I got so tired, I'm like, finally, asleep. And then I wake up again, like, not again. Here we go again, like trying to escape the day. Like looping it, looping it, looping it. And it's crazy. I've tried everything to change that. Like every surface thing to change it. Like living that, you know, game of being in denial. And it's what you said, too, with the, the Hawaii example that you guys shared. Um, I was in a situation where, objectively, I was God. I was Jesus. For real. Like, from my, the, the way I viewed my life, say, prior to the scandal is, I am the second coming of Christ. And I say this, I'm not even fucking joking, I believed it. If you put me on a lie detector, it's like, are you Jesus? <laughs> yes, I am. It would not fucking flinch. Why? Because I had everything I wished for. I fought hard for it against self-sabotage, but I got there. I had more money than I could spend, more validation than I could ever get from women, from men, clapping and hearing me talking about conquests with women. How much validation is that? It's like, and then I slept with her. <laughs> like, like, that is insane. It's like, not just it, and there's like, money here. And I'm like, money and validation and women. Like, that was my, like, and travel and cool friends. Like, I am Jesus. However. Kind of like how a lot of rappers think of themselves. Yeah. However, similar to Hawaii, underneath it all, I felt horrible. If I sat by myself, as I said in the beginning, for a little too long doing nothing, right back into hell. And that's something I'm sure a lot of you didn't even notice. Like, if you look at my old videos, beneath the surface, I'm in hell. I've accomplished a lot. I can fight against self-sabotage better than most, but I'm in hell underneath it all. And that's what we're trying to bring your awareness to here. It's like, hey, you're all here normal at the surface. Everyone's so busy keeping up that front to others and to themselves. But the sooner you can be honest here, like, okay, let's dive deep into this. And it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with me or that I'm less than other people. In reality, we're all like this. The sooner I can let it come up and the sooner I can process it. Because until you do, it's going to keep running you. You cannot escape it. You cannot outrun this shit. You've tried. And that's what really freaked me out. Like, prior to the scandal where I realized a lot of this is like, where I, where I basically like didn't have a choice but to confront this, is I've tried everything. And you have to kind of usually, don't use this as an excuse, but usually have to go through this road of realizing it didn't work. It's like that road of disillusionment until you're faced with the obvious like, okay, I tried everything, it didn't work, let's dive deep. But the sooner you realize this, the better, okay? And when you free yourself, now you're actually living. You're not living in a reaction. Your motivation isn't to escape yourself or to distract yourself or to fill a certain void. Now you're actually authentically living and you can actually enjoy it. Try to consider how pervasive this is in society as well. In, we live in a society where the most popular things are food that makes you feel unconscious mm. and drugs and alcohol are massive. How many of you guys in this room have trouble finding a partner who doesn't use drugs and alcohol? How much of a problem has that been for you? How many women that are really hot don't use massive amounts of drugs and alcohol? And think of the society that we live in where our version of partying is to go out and numb yourself. Did anybody here ever wish that like, instead of clubs just being filled with booze, it would just be like Chuck E. Cheese where everybody would just go have fun and like play arcade games. It'd be like Dave and Buster's, everybody would just go have fun. How much more fun would that be? It'd be so much better, right? And, and the thing is, it literally, most people's version of a weekend is go get fucked up. And the, the irony is when we go out to say a bar or club, on average, we have way more fun than anybody. We're always the people having the most fun there. Let's have maybe a quiet night. That can occasionally happen. And we're doing it stone sober. They have to poison themselves to medicate trauma. So the idea of fun for most people in this dimension that we're living in is medicate trauma. That's the shit. And you have this entire society, like say there's like rappers like get crunk, get crunk. To us, we're not fooled by that, bro. We're, you're not cool, bro. Like, you know, you could be talking, get crunk, get, like, like the rapping Except school. Except for Little Pump. Except his idol, Little Pump. Except Little Pump, who's very cool. But when you, when you look at, like, when you look at Little Wayne pumping down Caesarep, right? Like, what is that, promethazine and codeine in the double cup? How many people die from promethazine and codeine mix in that, like, Caesarep culture? 
a purple drink, they call it. It's kind of funny. They have health issues, too. Like, massive health issues. There's a whole bunch yeah. of these rappers that died from it. People just die from this shit all the time. Then you've got this incredible um, Prozac and SSRI addiction. Then you have um, the, the really big one is, the, is now Oxy, and they're called opioids. I mean, this is why I'm not even against the marijuana is because that's a plant that's not going to kill somebody if it can help to, to medicate their trauma. Thank God, because you, you see, like, at this point, anytime a famous person dies before age 40, what do we know? Opioids, 100%, or if not, a suicide. Maybe the, I mean, has there been a famous person that is under 40 that died from anything other than opioids or like a suicide recently? Very rare. Eminem's even been through it. He talks about it. The funny thing is, minor, I've never done this stuff. My understanding is like opioids, they, they just put you in this like weird numb state. And I mean, it doesn't like- Oh, actually like they're really like, if personal experience, hashtag personal experience, mm -hmm. they're, they actually make you feel fucking awesome. And that's why so many people die from this shit. Oh, really? Okay. I, My understanding is you're just kind of numb. What's that? Yeah, you're perfectly, you're perfectly numb. It's amazing. And uh, as, as of two weeks ago, I've been sober, I think, for a year now. So congratulations to myself. He almost drank himself to death, by the way. Uh, Evie almost drank himself to death. So at the same you time... You guys are like, okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, sure, that's right. Sure, sure. Um, so... Uh, the best way I would describe the feeling that they just talked about, it's like you're basically carrying a fridge on backpack straps on your shoulders and you're just carrying it through your day. And then you, you wait until, like, uh, until it's too much and it will pop. And you're like, you can't handle it anymore. Fuck it. Let's go. And that's how, uh, when I was going through my breakup, that's how I started drinking a lot. Then in, in that relationship, there was a lot of drugs involved in that too. And... That's what we are taught to believe that that's how we deal with shit. I went to the doctor. I'm like, okay, so I'm depressed. That was already like six months into this rampage. I was like, okay, I'm depressed. I'm, I'm taking pills. I drink too much. What do I do? And he's like, antidepressants. Here we go. So it's like, great. Now, now this, I take this thing that makes me completely numb. Now it knocks me out as well. It makes you sleepy as fuck. Perfect. Now I have another pill on top of everything that I'm taking already to numb myself even more, instead of solving the underlying issue that's even going on there. This prescription medication thing's so crazy. I, I remember once I dated a stripper who's on every, who's on like antidepressant, some anti-schizo thing, this other thing, like it was like seven different medications to combat the effects of the other medications to make some like, bounce, like some kind of hope of, and these doctors just, Prescribe it. But, but like, you, you even say to a dog, hey, I have anxiety. What do they give you? Xanax. Exactly. Oh, are we allowed to say uh, names sure. of drugs? Yeah. Yeah, they give you Xanax. Pop Xanax. Like, kids pop those pills like m &Ms. And they actually feel tested right here. They make you feel amazing. And that's how you get hooked. It's super easy. It numbs you amazing in an amazing way. You're, like, basically in this warm blanket. You don't give a fuck about anything. And it, that's how you live your life until at some point you either drop it all or you just die. So kind of figured it out on your own. Like and what's, it, what's and more at some, important. at some point the proactive consciousness goes to sleep and the body now just wants more of the substance. Mm -hmm. Like the actual proactive consciousness that would say this isn't a good idea, with, it retracts. And unless you take the person and handcuff them to eventually go through the withdrawal, that person's not even there. They call it sitting on the person, I think, in addiction. And that person, there's not even a proactive consciousness there to fight it. And the substance takes over the, the biology and just makes them want more of that substance. It's also, if you want to get in some weird, like, spiritual elements, low vibration energy is running them mm -hmm. and making them do it. Now, in, in spiritual growth, the model that they would use for this, by the way, is <clears throat> they would, now, you can agree with this or not, but just look at them. It's just an interesting model to look at. Just keep your, your mind open to it. So let's say in spiritual growth, the model that they would use is they'd say that you're, at this, you're here and you have this like aura body or protection shield around you. Now, because in spiritual growth, they'd say that we live in a dimension that is very low vibration. Now, probably not because, you know, there's only entire continents of people killing each other. But anyway, you know, only like hundreds of millions of human to human murders last century. But anyway... You know, so basically what happens is that's like your aura body. That's your protection shield. Now, we always have low vibration energy entities trying to get in that spirit, trying to get into the core. So then what happens is if the low vibration energy entities see that the person is doing harm to their protection shield, 
it will clear the, the entities go, okay, let's run away. Now follow this. Imagine that you are a Viking tribe invading England and there's this big fucking castle and the castle has these big rock walls. And then all of a sudden these, these people who you've been kind of trying to like outlast and kind of get them hungry so you can go in and fuck them up and take all their shit. Now all of a sudden they start blowing holes in their own walls. And we're like, these fuckers are insane. And we're like, now they peek out and they, and they, and they seem to be blowing holes in their walls. So we're like, yo, they're blowing holes in their fucking protection shield walls. Let's just fucking hide in the woods while, while we do it. So now they're blowing holes in their walls. We run in the woods and then they think we're gone. Now, what do they think? Whenever we blow holes in the wall, the bad people go away. Shit just, they, they make this fake correlation, this mistaken correlation. Whenever we blow a hole in the castle wall, all these bad Vikings go away. Then all these holes get made, and what happens? Eventually, the Vikings are like, you don't say we're the Vikings, we're like, these fucking idiots just blew the, all the, the holes open. Let's fucking charge. And they just run right in. And if you like that model, then th from that angle, what you'd be seeing is somebody drinks, the low vibration energy entities go, this fucking moron, they run away, and now they're like, yay, 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 happy time, right? Because the LVE energies just ran off. But then what happens, the person later in the night, they get angry, they start, they go home with unattractive people, they get in fights, they get in drunk driving accidents, they call their ex and cry. They start crying. They go into massive low vibration spirals and all this really fucked up shit happens. What happens the next day? Massive hangover. What is the essence of low vibration energy? What is the essence of a deal with the devil? What is the deal with the devil? You get a big upfront payoff followed by this nasty, horrible bill on the back end. So most of these substances, if you, went, if you just thought that model was interesting, within that model, the way that they would explain it under that model is they'd say, you have a protection shield. When you do harm to yourself, such as eat horrible foods, bang girls raw, um, you know, by the way, what is another thing people do that have a lot of low vibration energy? They're called cutters. Mm. You ever heard of cutters? Yeah. What is a cutter? They have maybe borderline personality disorder or they have a personality disorder of any kind or depression. So to deal with that, they, they, they start, just start doing cuts. And all of a sudden, low vibration energy and you're like, oh shit, they're cutting themselves, run away. But then later, it comes flooding back. Likewise, if you're into any dark sexual stuff, s &M, what happens? Your sexual s &M partner starts hurting you, low vibration energy runs away, you get all hurt, later floods back. And by the way, how does the addiction cycle perpetuate itself? Let's say somebody addicted to s &M. Well, what happens is, you, you then feel shitty the next day. Well, now you wanna feel good, do another s &M thing. Another, another, another. Somebody addicted on, say, cocaine, what happens? Protection shield blows the holes in the walls. They feel a high from it for a bit. Eventually, they feel like shit. So what do they do? What deal with the devil do they make to make those bad feelings go away? What do they do? Up the dosage. Up the dosage. Do more coke. LV energies, boom, 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 goes away. More holes blow to the wall. Boom, back in. Mm. It happens again and again and again. And it gets to the point where that proactive consciousness in the person is no longer present. Now, this might seem like a fucking joke to you. And to be honest, it can, this does sound kind of funny. But the point is like, go downtown. Go downtown. Look at the people that literally all they can do is want to get their next hit. What, what's the cycle there? You run into hard times. You do some kind of hard drug, maybe heroin or something, right? Which is even way more next level. You're, the, you're as high as a fucking kite. You feel euphoria. You're going into the next goddamn dimension. Then, as you sober up, your protection shield is ravaged to shit. It's almost like a life-sucking thing out of your body. You certainly can lose teeth, get indented facial expressions, all this crazy shit, right? So then what happens is, now their life's going to shit. Now, imagine that you go to heaven. You're in this heavenly world of heroin. You come back out of it. Everything's all fucked up. Now your life is worse than when it started and your protection shield's blown out. What do you want to do? More heroin. Do that again for a couple of years, you're hooked as fuck. The chances of getting out of that or off meth, or like I've heard the success rate in getting off meth is like astronomically low. These substances can get people so hooked, it's astronomically low. Now this is drugs and alcohol, but as, as Julian's alluding to here, what happens in, what's, how are you medicating yourself day to day? G Gaber Mate, he wrote a book called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. He says, 
We're taking these addicts off the street. We put them in jail where they get further, whether raped, traumatized, assaulted, in prison, get further traumatized. They're already traumatized in the streets in a cycle. We're taking these addicts as criminals, put them in jail. And, you know, the principle behind that being that, they're, you know, they're engaging in behavior that makes them a burden to society. They're trying to discourage that. I get the idea behind it. But I promise you, in three, 400 years, if modern society is not, not around, this is going to be viewed as fucking archaic. Mm. And they put them in jail. They get further traumatized. They come out. What's going to happen? You think they come out healed? Oh, my God. And so, and then they're just a further burden. And they're a burden to taxpayers, if, if you care about that. So Gabriel Mate says it's from trauma. But here's Gabriel Mate's point. We look at the drug addict as the bad guy. When in fact, you yourself could be medicating trauma in a, in a myriad of ways that are legal. Maybe you're addicted to business. Oh, now you're the successful business guy. But in fact, mm. you're getting accolades for just medicate. You're literally doing that business stuff to medicate a trauma, but you get accolades. The drug addict doesn't, even though you're doing at its core the same behavior, fulfilling the same needs, but one person took one way, one person took another. Now, this is a complex issue. I'm not saying that we need to you know, give a CEO salary to someone addicted to heroin, but I'm just making the point that there's more going on here beneath the surface. Now, here's a question. If we look at this extreme version, where's the version of this that you're doing in your everyday life? You're in a society where they're going, get crunk, get crunk. What does that really mean? Can't fool us. It means medicate trauma, medicate trauma. They're glamorizing the medication of trauma. Rappers and, and partiers and stuff, they're glamorizing the medication of trauma as if that is the pinnacle and rather than getting people to look and reflect upon their lives and how they're just basically coping through their day. Another big one too, that I'm sure a lot of you can relate to, is porn. There's a reason this whole no fat movement is so big, because that's a go-to for guys to medicate their trauma. That's your version of being a fucking addict. It's shocking too, and I see this, if you go a little deeper in the surface in coaching, it's like how hooked people are on fucking porn. Like it runs their lives. Why? Because you're home and you're like, fuck, an easy escape where I get, you know, a little moment of bliss at the end. And then you try to prolong it. It's like, I know people like spend literally hours sorting through the different videos to find the perfect sequence to come to. Anyone do this? Raise your hand for real. Like, and that, that's the joy. It's like the longer you spend sorting your little sequence, like, oh, I can escape reality, escape reality. And then as soon as you're coming, like, fuck, I got to wait a couple hours or an hour. So I'm like, that's for the next rounds. That's how you run their fucking lives. When somebody's in low vibration energy like this, they believe that happiness is found in the physical. So they will perceive any of us up here as like, okay, let's say that you guys do like what we're saying, okay? Let's say that you guys do like what we're saying and you're like, okay, this is, this, this is like something I could correlate to my own life and maybe it makes sense. Imagine if we're up here and we're going, hey, look at the crystal, like that. That is how this talk looks to them. It's completely unrelatable. That's how they're seeing, like they're seeing Julian as like, uh, uh, let's just do, let's imitate what they're seeing. Oh, don't worry about results to be happy. Just be a fucking okay, space sure. fairy. <laughs> uh, be space fairies like us. Don't worry about money. You can be a space fairy. Right? And then they're confused as fuck because we do millions in revenues and we get laid to the hot girls. And they're like, how do these space fairies get the results that I want? And it pisses them off. They're like, these freaking space fairies are crushing me. So there's something they're doing. What is it? And we're like, heal trauma. And they're like, no, it can't be that. Results. Of course, results. We've broken down how to get results for years. We'll always do that. But there's this other layer that if you're results oriented, like, look, what if I tell you this? I put out one video, I make quarter million bucks in 12 minutes. That sound like results? Okay. I got a seven time Playboy Playmates in the back of the room that's here to fuck me, but I think she just went to the bathroom. Is that results? It depends what you think. I don't know. Okay. You know, I, I throw out an Instagram post, the room fills up with people in 24 hours. Is that result? Is that, is that enough? I live in a mansion. Is that enough? What do you need me to show you? to talk about results. But funny enough, the people who would even see that, they're like, well, they just make money by being like, will you? they think it's like a pyramid scheme where we say, do this, and then people pay us to say to do it or something. They can't see it. Like even in saying that, they're like, that's the first thing that made sense in this fucking story. And they believe that. And just, you cannot reach them. Mm -hmm. So what they believe from their reticular activation system, what they're seeing 
You ever, you ever just watch a speaker where you, you just, you're like, how does anyone like this speaker? Do you ever feel that way? Like, it's like some speaker, it's, like, it's almost like nails on a chalkboard. Like, can't they get to the point? It's annoying as fuck. This shit's stupid. Who would watch? How is there an audience for this? Audience for this must be fucking morons. If somebody in this mode sees it in that light and even looks at you guys as morons, like, you guys are like, let's all do it together. Yeah, I'm a fairy. Look at me. Look at you. I'm a fairy. We're a fairy. Okay. They're like, now they're spitting water. They're doing jokes now. Tell get me to the point. get to the point. And by the way, somebody in low vibration energy, whenever we joke, it's like nails on a chalkboard. Because jokes to somebody in low vibration energy, it's like kryptonite. You'll see it when somebody's in low vibration energy carrying massive trauma, you joke and they're just like, they're just like, eh. like they'll roll their eyes at it. Because they, what is the essence of low vibration energy? You're not happy with the present moment. You want to get to a better future. So what is a joke? A joke is something that centers you to the present moment. It says, let's celebrate this moment for no reason at all. Be silly and playful like a kid. Now, if you're in trauma energy, you're imagining this awesome future. So you don't want to joke. You don't want to have fun right now because you're in pain. The joke is just, it's like, you ever been mad and someone tries to give you a hug? You ever do that? You ever been pissed off? And like your girlfriend's like, let me hug you. And when she hugs you, it's like, ah, stop. <laughs> That's a joke to somebody in low vibration energy. So that's why you'll see them with, with this kind of low vibration look in the pupils. They don't want to joke around. And if you joke with them, it's, it's as if you're, you're giving a hug. Your girlfriend's giving you a hug when you're in, in an angry state. They don't like it. And they're, but here's the irony. They're trying to build this, this happy future where they can be happy, but they can't be happy right now. And they're training their mind to wait for the future to be happy. And they're not dealing with the underlying trauma. Most of these people are living in a first world country, their life is better than 99% of people on the earth, but they still can't enjoy it. The life is so short. Every minute of your life that you're not unhappy is basically being robbed from you. They can't do it. And, and I get dragged into this in business sometimes because when I do a meeting, I want to joke around. Have, I want to get serious and, and lay it down, but I want to enjoy it. There's nothing you can pay me, nothing you can pay me to do a meeting that's just a shitty fucking meeting because I don't know if I'm going to die by the end of that fucking meeting. So basically, it's like, I'm going to waste it now. I suppose there, there is a point where I'll whore myself out for some negative meeting. We're all going to be mad and fucking pity party and blame and rah, all this shit. But I want to enjoy myself, whatever I'm doing, because I don't know how long I'm going to be alive. So let's enjoy it. So the key to energy work, the key to trauma healing is what you're working on is creating a protection shield or an energetic body that's cleansed of trauma as much as you can. And, and it's always a work in progress and is present to the moment and happy regardless what's going on. And then from there, you can go about life and get results and make money and get laid and, and do whatever you want to do. But from that space, and you're not being run. Say that with me. I'm not being run. Say it again. I'm not being run. So instead of taking, because what we see with our friends with trauma energy is they do get results, but they self-sabotage like crazy. Even try to help them, they'll self-sabotage that because if you actually help them, they're in that web of the, of the trauma. And if you're to get them out of it, they wouldn't be getting their trauma needs met, their addiction met to it. So they think, so ironically, they're like, I'm about results and trying to move forward and, and do better. But then right when they're on the cusp of greatness, they fuck it up. They think the results come from being mad. They're like, well, if I was happy, I'd be like, fairy, and I wouldn't do anything. They don't realize that, no, you're being run. You're, you're just being fucking run. If you were happy, you could choose. And you know what? If being happy, you chose something different, that's okay. They also don't even enjoy the results. Like, if you don't enjoy the results, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you chasing results? Those are not results if you don't enjoy them. They're nothing. This whole speech here, again, should bring your awareness to it. Like, hey, let's check beneath the surface. What is actually running me? Let's start seeing beneath the surface in other people. When are they triggered? Just that you know, effect, like that dynamic of being triggered will change your life when you see people freaking out. You're like, oh, they're just being triggered. And even then, by the way, we were talking about being, you know, taken over, like, say, by alcohol and, like, you're le there's less of you there. That also happens when you're triggered. Do you ever feel that? Like, you get pissed off and it's not even you. It's something takes over. Well, guess what? Some people, they just live in that state where something took over and they're not even there anymore. What is one of the laws of low vibration energy it wants to spread? Look, you ever been in a great mood and you just want to share that great mood? Like, you're laughing, you just want to share all this great jokes. That's great for when you're out meeting people, right? Well, in the same way, that negative energy, you ever been in a horrible mood and you just want to pipe off on somebody? That energy wants to jump out. Mm -hmm. 
And if somebody's protection shield goes down all the way, the net, if you believe in that model of spiritual growth, the low vibration energies take over the person. Go look at videos of people who have been taken over by low vibration energy who went and did some atrocity. And what you'll see is like a demon rutting them. Mm. And a big thing too is somebody who is completely steeped in high vibration energy, somebody who's quote unquote enlightened, will have these big bright eyes that don't waver. Like they can look at you right in the eye and they don't need to like look away and fidget. That's because they're completely steeped in high vibration energy, or at least in a great way. Have you ever had a night out, maybe where you're out meeting people, and the high vibration energy was just flowing, and you just see maybe somebody from across the room and just look at them dead in the eye, and they'd run over to you? Ever had that experience? Okay, I hope you have. Well, in the same way, when someone goes deep into low vibration energy, you'll actually see it to where they can hold that steady gaze, a very shark-like gaze. And I've seen this with friends of mine where they start going into the physical, and tapping into the physical, and then they start feeding off low vibration energy. You ever seen the movie, um, the, the uh, third Star Wars, uh, Revenge of the Sith or whatever it was, where Anakin Skywalker is literally taken over, and by the end he's just fucking crazy. He, he, he kills the mother of his children. He's like, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I don't trust you. No, you're bad, because he's literally been taken over by low vibration energy. That's real. Now that Star Wars is a fictional movie, but that's a real phenomenon right there. And that actually happens, and that's where, and, and the big joke is like, you know, somebody will commit some atrocity, and like, people, the, you know, the, the talking heads come up, they're like, you know what they just need to realize? That's not appropriate. It's like, no, you need to realize that they're being run by a demon. That's the fact that you even think that that, that could be fixed at the level that you're talking about is insane. And if you even study things like borderline personality disorders, and you see when somebody has a direct connection to low vibration energy, it just can literally slip in and run them. There's been a, a there's like a Swiss cheese in their protector shield. There's big problems. One thing that I think a lot of people underplay is like, look at myself. I haven't been sick in over six years, not even a common cold. I can do this speech right now on days of crappy sleep. What's going on there? I'd ask you what you think is going on. I'm not gonna give you the answer. You just decide what's like, it's assume you have to get a common cold or fevers. Why doesn't that happen anymore? Kind of weird. What's going on there? What kind of changes can you make? All of a sudden, groups of guys like ourselves can do improvisational speaking without preparation. What's going on there? What are some of these things that you're seeing? I don't really get in a bad mood very easily. Very, very rare. Um, sometimes I'll try to pretend to make a point with people because I feel like I can't reach them any other way. You know, I'm still working on it. I've got a ways to go with it, but it's been incredibly improving after years of being depressed. Got a ways to go still. Probably fuck up here or there, but you see my point. So there's a lot that's going on at play here. And most of you believe that at the surface of life, you're seeing reality. You're not even realizing that there's a bigger game being played here. Everything from an entire society of people being run by trauma, which is hysterical. Oh, well, that means horrible, but it's like ironic, right? Like, cause they think it's like what they're doing is awesome. But in addition to that, they're not even seeing like this bigger game of these karmic threads that, are, that people are attached to that literally provoke reaction, feed each other reaction. Just go to a place like a gang infested, um, you know, inner city neighborhood and see these links that they have to each other. Take that gang member, put them into a classy environment, see that he doesn't find his way back. And there's needs being met there. Cortisol addiction, adrenaline addiction. You can actually tell what level of energy somebody is at by looking in deeper. Read books like David R. Hawking's Power Versus Force or um, you know, Levels of Energy by Fred Dawson. You don't need to agree with the whole book. A lot of the book's kind of wacky. But the general framework of those levels of energy, study it, see where you're at. Ironically, people in the lower levels can't see it. There's nothing that we can say to somebody who, you know, who, who, who isn't in a position to move up. The average person is moving down. You can only typically even reach somebody who has hit the rock bottom and is moving up. What do we see in alcohol and drug counseling? What do we say they have to do first before we can help them? What? They have to hit bottom. They're on a, they're on a downward spiral to bottom. And if you look in our world, you see at like all this like atrocities, demented, fucked up shit. And the way that this energy manifests itself, everything from extreme versions, which then we can, look, we, we can use to recognize what's going on, but even things like minor versions of what we're doing ourselves and realizing how this can empower our lives. And Julie and I and Evie have all seen some really fucked up shit that... You know, we've had the dance of the devil. We walked through the shadow of the valley of death. We've seen it. And, you know, we have some videos coming out about it, just sort of talking openly about it. We've seen some really fucked up stuff. And, um, you know, this is kind of a message that we want to get out there.
You wake up and immediately check your phone. You start scrolling through Facebook, through Instagram, until that knot in your stomach starts forming. You know the one. You start feeling envious. You start beating yourself up. Why don't I have what they have? And you start your day. Now you're upset and stressed out. You're missing out on so much while everyone else is living the good life. What did I do to deserve this? You drink your coffee and stuff some food down your throat, trying to numb this feeling, but you know it's here to stay. Now you're off to work. Quickly distract yourself by putting on some music, turning on the radio. Someone cuts you off. You curse like hell. That feeling is amplified. At work, people irritate you and rub you the wrong way. New tasks get thrown at you as you just try to get through the day. And for what? As soon as you're home, you distract yourself with a movie, a show, anything to escape this feeling that's been growing inside of you. When does this stop? This painful life, this life of escapism, of medication, of distraction? Did you ever just stop and ask yourself, is there another way? It's crazy how how any of us can manage without something like this. It's been the first time in over 10 years uh, since my dad died that I actually felt like I did before. I felt so much shame when it comes to being me. Uh, and now I don't feel that shame anymore. That was amazing, just being able to finally find that, that root reason. I, I believe that's probably Man, I've been searching for a long time to try to find that root reason of why I'm... I think that's it right there, and uh, it's amazing to share with you guys. I had no way of being able to deal with that pain. I had no way of being able to handle it, and for the first time in my life, I finally feel an inner stillness and peace in myself. I didn't even know what was happening. Like, my hands were just shaking, and it was just like me being my authentic self. It's just the best experience of my life that I just had today. I just want to give like a big scream to a crowd. I never did it. Can I scream? Yeah! yeah! I really want to thank each and every one of you out of the bottom of my heart. Thank you guys.